Okay, let me catch us up on who Aeschylus is and what's happened in the 200 years between uh, Hesiod and, and Aeschylus, and then we'll come back and compare uh, Aeschylus's psychology to uh, Hesiod's. Uh, Aeschylus lived around sometime between 525 and 456 BCE. We know he died in 456 uh, BCE. Uh, his father was named Euphorion and his son was named Euphorion and he had a, a grandson named Aeschylus. That's gonna be important because even though we know that he, he wrote many plays, there's some dispute as to whether or not th the famous Aeschylus, the playwright, actually wrote Prometheus Bound. The fact that Aeschylus, son of Euphorion, actually had a grandson who was also Aeschylus, son of Euphorion, uh, will maybe help explain that, but that's still an unsettled matter. Aeschylus uh, was a veteran of the Persian Wars, and he fought at uh, two of the, of the most famous uh, battles between the Greeks and the Persians, uh, at the Battle of Marathon, uh, after which you know we have the famous story about the, the Greek uh, uh, veteran of, who survived the Battle of Marathon after the Greeks had won, ran back to Athens and then collapsed, uh, of, dead of exhaustion once he had delivered the message, and that's where we get our word for r the, the running uh, of a marathon. Uh, Aeschylus was a, a veteran of Marathon and uh, probably also a veteran of the Battle of the Bay of Salamis. Uh, and I believe this is the one that's uh, uh, the, the subject of the second 300 movie. But this is someone who was not just a playwright his whole life. He was very familiar with uh, this uh, emerging uh, city-state, the emerging culture, the emerging identity uh, of the city of Athens, uh, which stood against this growing uh, Persian Empire. Uh, remember the same Persian Empire that, uh, that, freed the, um, that freed the Israelites and the Judeans from Babylonian captivity and sent them uh, back to Jerusalem. Uh, the same Persian Empire made its way across Anatolia and was trying to take over uh, Greece, the, these individual Greek city-states. The Greek city-states like Athens and Sparta uh, united long enough to defeat the Persians and then to defeat them again and to, to defeat them once again. Uh, and Aeschylus was right there in this, uh, during these battles. In fact, he identified with his role as a soldier so much that on his tombstone, uh, he had uh, a description of himself as a, uh, a veteran of the, the Persian Wars, uh, rather than identifying himself as a playwright. So it seems to, uh, that his, uh, his uh, military career was more important to him. But it's more than just a military career, it's his role as a, one of these sort of founding members of this emerging uh, city-state of Athens. Although Athens had been around a long time, uh, it was just now becoming this major cultural power after defeating the Persians. And Aeschylus is the first of the, what are referred to as the three great Greek tragedians, uh, tragedian being a writer of tragedy. Uh, after him, um, shortly, or actually during his lifetime, uh, Sophocles and Euripides would begin uh, writing, uh, uh, begin writing dramas as well. Now when I call him a tragedian, I should disambiguate some of these terms. Uh, drama, as it was defined in the ancient world, uh, Aristotle defines drama as an imitated human action, and that includes tragedy and comedy. Uh, later, when we talk about drama specifically, stage drama as opposed to social drama, um, we, we mean something like a story told in action by actors who impersonate characters. This is different than uh, a narration. Uh, so whether you read a novel or you, uh, if you were listening to Homer sing the Iliad, in all those cases, a narrator is telling you what the characters said, and a narrator is telling you what the characters were thinking and what, what was happening, what the backstory was. But on the stage, everything is dialogue, except for when a narrator comes to tell you what happens between scenes or that sort of thing. And tragedy, in this sense, does not mean what we typically mean by it today. Typically when we use the word tragedy, it means something bad happened. That's not necessarily a tragedy in the Greek sense. Aristotle defines tragedy this way. He says, tragedy is a representation of an action that is heroic and complete and of a certain magnitude. Uh, by means of language enriched with all kinds of ornament, each used separately in the different parts of the play, it represents men in action and does not use narrative. Uh, in other words, it doesn't just tell you, you know, here's what's happening right now. You have to watch what's happening. The, the actor has to re represent what's happening. And through pity and fear, it affects relief to these similar 
to these and similar emotions. In other words, this drama, we watch these people go through all these different emotional states and it helps us get our own pity and fear out, our own empathy. Uh, it, uh, we, we sort of purge ourselves of these uh, feelings and we sort of feel differently, maybe we're more rational after the play is over. We're able to think more, more clearly after we've sort of gotten all these emotions out of the way, uh, in Aristotle's uh, opinion. But notice this does not say this is a story with a bad ending or that, that ends badly for somebody. Uh, in fact, some of the ancient Greek tragedies, like uh, uh, Aeschylus's uh, trilogy, uh, the Oresteia, ends with uh, you know things working out pretty well in the end. Also, when I use the word chorus, and when your text for Prometheus Bound uses the word chorus, this isn't talking about a part of a song, but the people singing that song. So it's the singers who act both as narrators and as unnamed background characters, both for the sake of uh, exposition. So. Despite what Aristotle says, the, the chorus is kind of narrating what's happening. Uh, they act as if they're speaking to the other characters, but they're sort of telling the audience what's going on uh, because keep in mind that uh, there would be no stagecraft. We wouldn't have these nice backdrops like we do uh, in, a, in a theater today. So as we move from uh, oral poetry where Homer or Hesiod or some other uh, singer has to describe what the characters are thinking and describe what the characters are saying. Uh, we're, the, we're moving into a new genre and that means a lot of new things become more important than they were in the, the narrated uh, type, of, uh, type of text. Although I, we will continue to call this narrative for a reason I'll come back to in a minute. But Hesiod, remember, claimed to be speaking for the muses. The muses told him, here's the way things work, and this allows him not just to say, here's what happened, as if he witnessed it himself, but he's also saying, here's what these gods were thinking at the time. Uh, there's no way that, even if we were there witnessing these things happen, there's no way we would know what was actually in the minds of the individuals present. So he's an inspired performer, and it just so happens uh, that uh, that community of uh, Anatolians that his, his father uh, belonged to that, that came from Anatolia to Greece, they settled in a, in a city called uh, Thespia or Thespis. And uh, Thespis literally means divinely inspired. Uh, so Hesiod is claiming divine inspiration as the, the source of his uh, uh, interpretive authority and his, his narrative authority. Now, maybe coincidentally, maybe this is, uh, maybe not a coincidence, but there was a person uh, about a, a century after Hesiod named uh, Thespis of Icaria, and he is identified as the first actor. Uh, Aristotle and others refer back to him and say this was the first person who was actually an actor rather than just a, a singer of a, of a tale. Uh, someone who didn't perform by describing what happened, actually he dressed up as the character and then started to say the the, the lines from that character's point of view as if he was that character. It might seem obvious to us now, but this was a, a big deviation from just describing a character to actually performing that character. He was the first to use a mask and costume. Uh, he added speech to what had been uh, formerly a choral performance, uh, you know, in other words, sung, and in that song is a description of what's happening. Uh, his, he put on the, the first tragic performance in 533 BCE, and his name, Thespis, which remember also the city that, that Hesiod's father uh, lived near, uh, Thespis meant divinely inspired. But after this individual named Thespis, we get the word thespian for an actor. This is someone who follows in the role of, of Thespis. Now, Thespis, as an actor, would be the only one on stage. Uh, he, there would be no dialogue, there would just be him speaking a soliloquy, you know, from his own point of view, or from that character's point of view. It was actually Aeschylus that added to this a second actor, uh, someone else who would uh, have this conversation. Uh, so you would need at least two actors to have an actual conversation, and Aeschylus was the first person to add that, uh, add that element. The Greek drama itself evolved, uh, appears to have evolved out of uh, ritual, out of a sacrifice. Uh, it seems that at one point there would be a sacrifice to the gods and there would be uh, a chorus there sort of singing about that god, singing praises to that god and singing the stories that connected with that god. Uh, but then later, instead of just singing about that god, you would have somebody like Thespis uh, playing the role of that god and doing it in front of the altar for everyone else to watch. 
And as this became more of a performance, you started to get more crowds showing up. And as you got more crowds showing up, they started to build these uh, uh, amphitheaters in, into hillsides so that more and more people could be seated you know, very far away and still hear what was being said. So our earliest uh, drama would not have had fancy scenery, wouldn't have any scenery really at all. You would have the altar behind you. Um, and there may, everything would have to be your imagination. You would see these two actors, uh, or maybe more as, as time goes on, they would be wearing masks, but as far as whether there was you know, a mountain in the background or a tree nearby or uh, you know, the gods riding chariots or something, all of that had to depend on dialogue. You had to hear them describing it, usually the chorus pointing at something and saying, uh, this is what we see far away. But this, uh, the theater was extremely important in, as Athens d developed during its uh, uh, fifth century uh, uh, era. And it was so important that uh, every citizen of uh, the city was expected to attend or was encouraged to attend uh, to the extent that oftentimes they were sort of, uh, tax money was collected so that they could uh, allocate, so they could make people able uh, to, to come to these performances. Uh, they were extremely political, although most of these plays were about the gods. There would be something that was obliquely a, a reference to uh, things going on in, in local politics at the time, and that was considered a, a good thing. You wanted people discussing politics and, and seeing this narrative or seeing this uh, play acted out with the sorts of themes that people are concerned about. The performances provoked political discussions. That was part of why they were important. These plays would be important because they provoked difficult conversations and uh, caused people to sort of have to point out details and uh, conflicts of interest and, uh, and situations that really uh, made uh, heavy demands or situations that demanded more thought than people might typically give it. Aeschylus being the first playwright in the sense of, of modern drama was very prolific. He, we know from references by other authors that he wrote at least 90 plays, maybe more. Unfortunately, only seven of these survive. And uh, they're individual parts of, of trilogies. We have one complete trilogy uh, in the sense of this is three plays that uh, continue the same story. Now, there were competitions at the time where one playwright would write a, a trilogy that would usually have a fourth play, which was a comedy, so they'd have three tragedies and a comedy, and usually the, the three tragedies would, be, would all be about the same theme, but they wouldn't be a continuous story. Uh, it's Aeschylus that really made, this, uh, made these trilogies an extended uh, narrative. But he wrote The Persians, which is the only thing that's come down to us that's about contemporary events. In other words, it's not about the gods and it's not about people in the past. Uh, it's about the, the Persian Wars in which he served. Uh, but notice when he writes The Persians, he's uh, having to get into the minds of the people that were his enemy. Uh, and he's having to think, well, how do these Persians really think? Uh, and, he, and he does a very sort of sympathetic job, a, a way that we don't often see uh, in, in time when uh, two cultures are at war, where one culture actually you know, shows the, the complicated psychology of the other culture. Uh, he's most famous for the Oristia, which is three plays about uh, the, uh, the king during the Trojan War, Agamemnon, and his murder by his wife, Clytemnestra, Clytemnestra's murder by her son, uh, Orestes, and then uh, the problem Orestes is in, uh, the, the fact that the Furies, these, these monstrous goddesses, would punish anyone who shed the blood of their own family but uh, Agamemnon had to, in order to uh, sail to Troy, uh, he had to sacrifice his own daughter. Uh, so he had to make this impossible choice between his own family and uh, the entire Greek army that was, uh, was stranded and was not gonna be able to, uh, to, to sail to Troy. Uh, after that, his wife takes revenge on him, and then that means her son is in this position where he's morally obligated by their culture to avenge his father, but he's also morally obligated not to shed the blood of his mother and because he kills her, the fates pursue him, but then uh, his uh, punishment or uh, innocence or guilt has to be decided by, uh, by a court case, essentially, where the goddess Athena pr presides over this uh, first court case to decide whether uh, Orestes should be punished for eternity or not. So the political aspects of this, even though they're describing something from the Trojan War, are very much focused on the way a justice system should work. And this is a very philosophical topic at a time when the way the, uh, the court of, of Athens is 
being sort of constructed, the, the Constitution is being uh, scripted. Prometheus Bound was part of a, a trilogy, and we know this because other authors refer to these other plays, and we have a few quotations from Prometheus Unbound, and we only have one quotation from uh, the play Prometheus Flamebearer, but we know that uh, Prometheus Bound was clearly not, uh, the end of Prometheus Bound was not the end of Prometheus uh, in, in Aeschylus's uh, larger narrative. Now, the, the plays were either ordered with Prometheus Bound first, followed by Prometheus Unbound, where, uh, where Heracles comes to, to rescue him, kills the bird that's tearing out his liver, uh, and there's this reconciliation with Zeus. And that was either followed by a, a play titled Prometheus Flamebearer, or what maybe seems more likely is that Prometheus Flamebearer may have actually come first. It may have been a story about Prometheus actually doing the stealing of fire, uh, that action itself. But we don't really know. We don't have enough information about Prometheus Flamebearer to, to really figure that out. But even though we only have Prometheus Bound uh, and we don't have uh, enough of the other two to really tell what was going on, uh, Prometheus Bound is enough to show us that this is a very different version of Prometheus than what we saw in Hesiod. And it's a very different psychology. Uh, and also the genre of, of drama forces us to look at individual characters and consider different points of view in ways that we didn't have to do in order to figure out what was happening in Hesiod. Hesiod tells us this is the way things happen. This is what Zeus was thinking. He adds these interpretations to uh, the descriptions of the, of the basic uh, elements. Um, Aeschylus can't do that because if he's depending on actors, he doesn't have the, the liberty of a narrator to just say, here's what this character was thinking. Everything depends on the dialogue. One of the first characters we see is the character of Kratos, uh, who in your text is, uh, they just use the name power. Well, the Greek term, the Greek name is Kratos. Uh, and yes, I suppose this is where the, the God of War uh, video game character comes from. But Kratos in this uh, representation has a very familiar psychology. He has the sort of authoritarian psychology that we saw uh, Hesiod uh, demonstrating. Uh, Whatever Zeus does is right because Zeus is the one that's, that's uh, most uh, powerful. So, but the genre of drama, especially when Aeschylus adds this, you know, the second actor to the stage, makes this clear distinction between the point of view of each character uh, and the presumably omniscient point of view of the narrator. Uh, Hesiod may be telling us the way things are, but the characters can only uh, tell us the way they think things are in a drama. Uh, they could be wrong. Uh, we might forget that the narrator's point of view is just a point of view, but uh, when we see characters arguing, we don't slip into that mode of sort of passive acceptance. We hear Kratos, uh, the personification of power, speaking in terms similar to Hesiod, but he is just a character, he's not the narrator, so we don't necessarily believe him. Uh, we just see the way he thinks and we compare that to the way other creatures, or other uh, characters think. So he says uh, to Hephaestus describing what Prometheus has done, you know, flashing fire, the source of all arts, he, Prometheus, has bestowed upon mortal creatures. In other words, he's broken the social order. Uh, such is his offense. For this he is bound to make requital to the gods, so that he may learn to bear with the sovereignty of Zeus and cease his man-loving ways. And uh, man-loving means, you know, these, uh, these ephemeroi, the, the word means literally creatures of a day. Uh, because human beings are born and die and you know the gods live forever, so why should you give any importance whatsoever to these weak, pathetic uh, creatures uh, who, who don't live forever? Uh, he's accusing Prometheus of, of breaking the social order as Zeus has established it. Uh, he says, every job is troublesome except to be the commander of the gods. No one is free except Zeus. Uh, as, as Hesiod said, you know, Zeus decides who's gonna be praised and who's gonna be condemned, who's uh, going to be successful and who's not. It doesn't matter what they do. Uh, for, and for all his cleverness, Prometheus is a fool compared to Zeus. So in or, in other, he doesn't just say, here's the way the world is and here's the way we should regard Zeus, but also his uh, criteria for what is intelligent, what is wise, depends on how you interact with Zeus. So when he looks at Prometheus, he doesn't see wisdom, he sees foolishness because it has led to Prometheus's being uh, tortured like this. That's all that matters for Kratos. Uh, Prometheus has now lost all power. That means that what he did is foolish. There's no other criteria that he considers. 
we see basically the same thing happening with Hermes. And Hermes, the, the Roman god Mercury, the messenger of the gods, is another god that's supposedly you know, very intelligent. This is known for intelligence. He's, he's credited in some uh, uh, Greek text with giving human beings the ability to write, the technology of writing. But obviously in, in Aeschylus, uh, writing uh, is given to humans from uh, Prometheus. But he says to Prometheus, to you, the clever and crafty, bitter beyond all bitterness, who has sinned against the gods in bestowing honors upon these creatures of a day, these ephemeroi. To you, thief of fire, I speak. The father commands that you tell what marriage you boast of. So uh, Prometheus has said out loud that he knows that eventually Zeus is going to uh, have a, a child with this particular female, maybe a goddess, maybe a human, uh, but the, the son that that woman bears is going to overthrow Zeus, is gonna be more powerful than him. But he doesn't know who, and of course uh, Zeus is a philanderer, so uh, he has to be careful. Uh, and he, he wants to know who this is so that he doesn't end up like his own father and, and his grandfather, overthrown by the next generation. Uh, so the father commands you to tell what marriage you boast of, whereby he is to be hurled from power. And this, mark well, set forth in no riddling fashion, but point by point, in other words, Give it to me straight, don't hide it in this riddling language. Uh, explain point by point as the, the case exactly stands. And do not impose upon me a double journey, Prometheus. In other words, don't make me come back and ask you twice. Uh, you see, Zeus is not appeased by dealings such as yours. So this criteria of what is right, what you ought to do, is based exclusively on what Zeus what would appease Zeus. Appeasing power, that is the right thing to do, that is the only intelligent thing to do, according to Hermes. Bend your will, perverse fool. Oh, bend your will at last to wisdom in face of your present sufferings. In other words, wisdom is appeasing Zeus. Wisdom is giving in to power, according to Hermes. This is no counterfeited vaunting, but utter truth. For the mouth of Zeus does not know how to utter falsehood, but will bring to pass every word. Uh, in other words, Zeus is, it's impossible for Zeus to lie because in saying it, Zeus makes it happen. Uh, we all have to just recognize that whatever Zeus says becomes true. Uh, we, we don't question it ourselves. We don't try to prove Zeus wrong. Uh, may you consider warily and reflect and never deem stubbornness better than wise counsel. So both Kratos and Hermes are giving us this authoritarian view of what is right and wrong, what's to be considered intelligent, uh, and that sort of thing. Then we see a more sympathetic uh, point of view from Hephaestus. Uh, Hephaestus clearly wants to uh, support Prometheus. He, he feels like what Prometheus did came from a good place, at least. Uh, but he knows that he doesn't have the ability himself to decide uh, what to do in this, this matter. He has to help Zeus by binding Prometheus in these chains that can't be broken. And he says, speaking to uh, Kratos and Bia, uh, power and force personified. Uh, power and force, for you indeed, the behest of Zeus is now fulfilled, and nothing remains to stop you. But for me, I do not have the nerve myself to bind with force a kindred god upon this rocky cleft, assailed by cruel winter. Yet come what may, I am constrained to summon courage to this deed, for it is perilous to disregard the commandments of the Father. In other words, courage means I have to do this thing because I'm afraid of Zeus. Uh, uh, courage is not exactly what we might uh, otherwise call courage, but he's got to summon the will to do what he's told. Uh, maybe not what we mean by will either. But uh, two things that he doesn't want to do, and he decides to do the thing that will be the, less, the least dangerous for him. And then he says to Prometheus, lofty-minded son of Themis, who counsels straight, against my will, no less than yours, I must rivet you with the brazen bonds, no hand can loose this desolate crag. So he's apologizing to Prometheus, but also saying, I, I have to do this. Uh, the heart of Zeus is hard, and everyone is harsh whose power is new. So he's recognizing more so than, than Hermes or, or Kratos, that Zeus has his own psychology, and it may be a changing one. It's not just sort of some universal truth uh, that Zeus speaks, but he's this young god, he's now in power, and anyone who's new in power tends to be uh, a little too harsh, they may be a little too abusive with their power. So Hephaestus is sort of thinking about Zeus's thinking, but he's not gonna go so far as to challenge it. Like Hephaestus, the chorus has a sympathetic uh, disposition toward Prometheus, but uh, they 
seem to encourage him to just accept the, the order created by Zeus. So they'll, uh, res they respond to the seeing Io by saying, may Zeus who apportions everything never set his power in conflict with my will, nor might I be slow to approach the gods with holy sacrifices of oxen slain by the side of the ceaseless stream of Oceanus, my father, and may I not offend in speech, but may this rule abide in my heart and never fade away. Sweet it is to pass all life, uh, all length of life amid confident hopes, feeding the heart in glad festivities, but I shudder to look on you, racked by infinite tortures. You have no fear of Zeus, Prometheus, but in self-will you reverence mortals too much. Uh, so even though they sympathize with Prometheus, they still place the blame on, on him, rather than seeing any kind of moral culpability in Zeus himself. And they say, wise are they who do homage to necessity. Uh, necessity being just the way things are done, uh, rather than uh, looking to change it. Their father, Oceanus, also uh, empathizes with Prometheus, uh, and he does seem to think that there is uh, some need to work with Zeus, but he seems to uh, believe that he can negotiate the situation. Uh, rather than just uh, passively appeasing Zeus's will, uh, he says that he's going to go speak with Zeus, try to reason with him, uh, have him change his mind about Prometheus. Uh, but he also tells Prometheus, uh, he says, uh, learn to know yourself and adapt yourself to new ways. For new also is the ruler among the gods. If you hurl forth words so harsh and of such wedded edge, perhaps Zeus may hear you, though thrown from far off, high in the heavens and then your present multitude of sorrows shall seem childish sport. O oh, wretched sufferer, put away your wrathful mood and try to find release from these miseries. Perhaps this advice may seem to you odd and dull, but your plight, Prometheus, is only the wages of too boastful speech. You still have not learned humility, uh, nor do you bend before misfortune. Uh, his message is essentially keep quiet and let me work on this or see what we can work out. Uh, it's uh, it's it's non-confrontational, but it's not as co not as passive as that uh, the strategies of Hephaestus or uh, the uh, the chorus. One element of the story we can definitely say has been added by Aeschylus is the presence of Io. Uh, notice that uh, Hesiod focuses on Prometheus in relationship to Pandora. Uh, uh, there is no mention of Io in in relationship to Prometheus uh, elsewhere in the literature up to this point. It seems that Aeschylus inserted Io as a character into this, uh, not, because that she, not because she previously had any role uh, in the Prometheus story, but because she is an example of the excess of power. Uh, what has been done to her through no fault of her own uh, is a testament to just how wrong Oceanus and uh, even Hephaestus, but of course uh, Hermes and, uh, and Kratos for power, uh, all tell Prometheus that if he just gives in to Zeus's will, then his misfortune will uh, not be so bad. Uh, that uh, we all have to sort of bend to Zeus's will, but if we do that, then we're smart. But when Io steps into the scene, uh, we're confronted with someone who has done nothing wrong, uh, someone who has uh, tried to do the, the best thing uh, she had available, but her options from the time uh, Zeus's attention turned toward her uh, she was in a no-win situation. So the story she tells us is that uh, she finds out from uh, a Vatic oracle, uh, uh, someone who knows what's going on with the gods, that Zeus uh, is attracted to her and that she's supposed to go out into the fields at night and, uh, and have a rendezvous with Zeus. But of course she doesn't want to do that. For one thing, everyone who uh, has a relationship with Zeus whether or not it's it's their initiative, uh, incurs the wrath of Hera. Uh, Zeus's wife, queen of the gods, uh, can't take out her anger on Zeus directly, so she uh, always attacks the, the women that uh, Zeus lusts after. So if she says no to Zeus, then she's gonna incur Zeus's wrath. If she does not say no to Zeus, then she's going to incur Hera's wrath. And she goes to ask her father what she should do about that, and her father consults this oracle named Loxias, and uh, uh, Loxius says the only thing that you can do is send her away because uh, bad things are going to happen to her. But if she stays here and, and does not uh, give in to Zeus's will, then Zeus will take out his uh, anger and, and punish the entire, uh, our entire people. So to save her own people, she has to, to leave. She has to go off on her own. But still, Io has 
done everything she could. She's bowed to authority. She uh, gave in to her, her father's authority. Her father gave in to the religious authority who was speaking on behalf of Zeus. She's, through, through no fault of her own, she's being punished by uh, Zeus, uh, by Zeus's irresponsible actions, his sort of self-serving uh, abuse of power. And we hear this from her point of view directly. We hear Prometheus who knows her story already, but also we hear her ask, you know, why is this happening to me? She says, where is my far roaming wandering course taking me? In what, O son of Cronus? In other words, she's talking to Zeus as if he was there. Uh, o son of Cronus, in what have you found offense so that you have bound me to this yoke of misery? Are you harassing a wretched maiden to frenzy by this terror uh, the, of the pursuing gadfly? Consume me with fire, or hide me in the earth, or give me to the monsters of the deep to devour. But do not grudge, O Lord, the favor that I pray for. Uh, it's Prometheus that tells her this is uh, because of Hera. Uh, Hera is, is sending these things because Zeus lusted after her. But uh, she's still in this no-win situation, not because of her own actions, but because powerful uh, beings, people, or entities higher than her in the, uh, the, the social hierarchy uh, want things that uh, are in conflict with each other and she's at the center of that conflict through no fault of her own. And of course, this is also the, the first time we hear Prometheus describe his own thinking from his own point of view. Uh, Hesiod never really gives us uh, much about Prometheus in his own terms. How does he consider, or how does he think of, how does he justify his stealing a fire from the gods and giving it to humans? Uh, we don't get that in Hesiod, and we don't get that in, in, in other versions of this story that come before Aeschylus. It's simply a description of the thing he did and why it was a bad thing because it crossed the all-powerful Zeus. And the interesting thing is we don't get a consistent uh, point of view from him. He changes his mind, he, he sort of goes back and forth, he feels one way in one scene and then he re makes a recognition that uh, changes his thinking about his situation. At first, and then and some, uh, often throughout the, the play, he'll say things like, look at what a shameful torture I'm uh, racked with and must wrestle throughout the countless years of time apportioned to me, such as the ignominious bondage the new commander of the blessed has devised against me. Woe, for my present misery and misery to come, I groan not knowing where it is fated that, that deliverance from these sorrows shall arise. So he's speaking out of pain. He's speaking out of uh, a reaction to his... Uh, his situation that seems overwhelming. And he's saying, I don't know how this is going to go. But then in the very next line, uh, he says, and yet what am I saying? All that is to be, I know full well and in advance, nor shall any affliction come upon me unforeseen. I must bear my allotted doom as lightly as I can. Uh, so he sort of remembers that I do know uh, what's going to happen next, and I do know why this is happening. And I do know that it's almost as if he affirms the decision that he's already made. Yet I am not able to speak nor be silent about my fate, for it is because I bestowed good gifts on mortals that this miserable yoke of constraint has been bound upon me. I hunted out and stored in fennel stock uh, the stolen source of fire that proved a teacher to mortals in every art and means to a mighty ends. Such is the offense for which I pay the penalty, riveted in fetters beneath the open sky. So he's remembering that this current state he's in uh, is something that he knew he would be in, but he also sort of affirms the reason uh, for doing it in the first place. Uh, and he dismisses those uh, like the, the Oceanids, the, the, the Chorus, uh, as well as Hermes and, uh, and Kratos, uh, when he says, you know, worship, adore, fawn upon whoever uh, is your Lord. Uh, but he remembers also that he saw Zeus overthrow his own father, Cronus. He, he saw Cronus overthrow his father, Uranus. And he knows that Zeus himself is not uh, eternal. Uh, this is a very different description of Zeus than we got in Hesiod. Uh, Prometheus is aware of, of Zeus's uh, limitations, uh, of Zeus's fate. And so he says, have I not seen two sovereigns cast out from these heights? A third, the present Lord, shall live to see, I shall live to see cast out in ruin, most shameful and most swift. So by describing Zeus as the present Lord, he is limiting him in time. This is not Zeus eternal. Uh, this is not Zeus the, the unstoppable, the Zeus the, the, the ultimate authority. This is the guy who happens to be ahead of the game right now. And in that, Prometheus introduces a very different perspective on Zeus. In all of these uh, 
characters' descriptions of themselves and their descriptions of other characters, we get, we as the audience, or we as the readers, get much more into the psychology, into the, uh, the way that these characters think than we ever could have in, in Hesiod. Now that's not to say that drama naturally uh, is, is more uh, focused on the, the thoughts of the characters, uh, because when we get to Homer, we'll see the narrator can give us a lot of uh, the each individual character's point of view and show us how those characters are in conflict. But drama has to. Drama, uh, you know, unless you had actors just sort of narrating their parts, uh, in which case that might even be an internal monologue, all you have are these different perspectives. And when you see those perspectives aren't always accurate, when people underestimate other characters, or when characters think other characters are planning something that they're not actually planning, or they don't see uh, the danger that, that the other character is, is plotting. Uh, all of this uh, takes us into what uh, psychologists call theory of mind. And theory of mind, one of the earliest definitions, is uh, theory of mind is the capacity to impute mental states to self and others, and to predict behavior on the basis of these states. Uh, so, in other words, this is my ability to try to figure out what you're thinking based on cues and the way and the things you say, uh, but not just the content of your words, but maybe the the tone of your speech, maybe your body language, maybe knowing your your history and knowing that oh this uh, w when you use this phrase it's a it's an exaggeration, but when you use this phrase it's uh, it's an understatement. You're you're hiding something. There's something you don't want to tell. Uh, so it's never just gauging someone else's thoughts by the words they use. Uh, and anthropologist Robin Dunbar says that having a theory of mind means being able to understand what another individual is thinking, to ascribe beliefs, desires, fears, and hopes to someone else, and to believe that they really do experience these feelings as mental states. When we engage with another person, when we talk to another person, we're not only thinking about uh, what they may be referring to, but we're also trying to represent ourselves a certain way. We want them to think well of us, we want them to uh, not think we're uh, plotting against them, or we want them to take us seriously, not think that we're lying to them, and this sort of thing, even if we are. And if we are lying to someone, then we don't want them to know that we're lying. Uh, but I might also wonder, is this person lying to me? Does this person actually know what he or she is talking about? Uh, or could this person be mistaken? If we're talking about a, a third person who's not present, I have to think about how well the person I'm talking to knows the person she or he is talking about. Uh, how well they know that other person's mind. And maybe I know that person's mind better than they do, but maybe I only think I do. Uh, when we have an ordinary conversation, we have to engage in theory of mind to, to several different levels. And when we read fiction, we usually have to go one or two steps beyond that, because we have a, an author representing these characters to us. Uh, so sometimes we may doubt how well that, that author really knows his or her characters, uh, or how uh, a, a representation of a character in narrative may not do the story justice. And we can usually tell when we read badly written characters that make decisions that don't seem to go with their, um, the way they've been represented so far, that uh, even the author doesn't have total control over any kind of representation of the mind of the, the character, or the mind of that, the, the characters see in other characters. And uh, psychologists uh, David Comer Kidd and Emmanuel Castano uh, uh, published a, uh, study in uh, the journal Science uh, back in 2013, in which they tested people's uh, theory of mind after they read nonfiction, like scientific works, you know, works that are very intelligent, uh, require a lot of intelligence, but they're not about people and people thinking about people. They compared those people to people who had just read uh, literary fiction that I involved people trying to represent themselves and try to understand other people. And they said that, or they, they found that uh, people who just read the fiction, the literary fiction, were much better at uh, figuring out from subtle facial cues and uh, subtle tells uh, what people were actually thinking. If, if someone was angry but trying to sort of suppress that, that face, they would see a picture and they would be able to accurately guess that this person is angry as opposed to just saying this person looks bored or something like that. And they say that the capacity to identify and understand others' subjective states is one of the most stunning products of human evolution. It allows successful navigation of complex social relationships and helps to support the empathic responses that maintain them. Empathy meaning that I'm trying to be able to figure out what's uh, going on in your head. Uh, more critically, whereas many of our mundane social experiences may be scripted by convention, and scripted here means the same thing it means in, in Shank and Abelson's term uh, of a cognitive script. Uh, 
Many of our mundane social experiences may be scripted by convention and informed by stereotypes. Those presented in literary fiction often disrupt our expectations. In other words, defamiliarize us, make us uh, look at something that we might dismiss as familiar and we might not really look at that closely, but instead say, wait, our expectations may, may not be enough. Uh, the usual schemas that we apply to a person or the usual scripts that we apply to a situation may not be enough. I may need to reassess uh, what's going on here. Uh, so readers of literary fiction must draw on more flexible interpretive resources to infer the feelings and thoughts of characters. That is, they must engage in theory of mind processes. Now, you've had to do this before. The last time I talked about uh, theory of mind was when we read in Atrahasis this strategy that Enki had uh, in order to get uh, the gods Namtara and Adad to remove the, the plagues that they had sent on, on humanity, the, the plague in Namtara's case and the drought in Adad's case. Uh, and to do that, he, Enki tells Atrahasis to tell the humans to not make any sacrifices to the gods, but then eventually make a sacrifice to either Namtar or Adad um, at each of those individual times, and then make them feel ashamed, make, them, make Namtar and Adad realize that they have been given this gift by the people that they are harming, and so that they'll feel shame and then they'll, they'll uh, take the, the plague or the drought away. Uh, and this seems to work. We don't get much of an explanation about it, but we have to understand, uh, in order to understand what's going on there, we have to understand why Adad and Namtara will feel bad and why they will uh, remove the, the affliction, which means uh, we have to understand what Atrahasis is trying to get them to do, which means we have to understand how Enki is trying to get Atrahasis to think about how Nantara and Adad will think about him and the other humans. That means um, one mind has to think about how another mind can understand another mind, and then we as readers have to understand all three of those levels, or all four of those levels. And so when we have this uh, debate between Oceanus and Prometheus about how to deal with Zeus, uh, Oceanus is trying to help Prometheus out, uh, but clearly they disagree on the kind of strategy. Uh, Oceanus maybe doesn't take it quite as seriously as, as Prometheus does. So uh, it goes this way. Oceanus says, do you uh, not know then, Prometheus, that words are the physicians of a disordered temper? That sounds like a nice little aphorism, a nice little uh, sort of platitude or cliche that kind of you know, people can use as a, as a script uh, and say, well, you know, words are the physicians of a disordered temper. Zeus has a disordered temper, and speak to him nicely, and you can, you know, solve that problem. But it's a little too simple uh, for Prometheus. Prometheus says, if one softens the soul in, in season, and does not hasten to reduce its swelling rage by violence. In other words, it depends on the state of mind of the person you're talking to. Uh, in which case, if I go talk to Zeus right now, he's probably just going to uh, lash out and use violence. Oceanus responds, what lurking mischief do you see when daring joins to zeal? Teach me this. He's being a little bit sarcastic. And Prometheus replies, lost labors and thoughtless simplicity. Uh, in other words, he's not going to just do the easy thing because this simplistic thing uh, will undo all that he's done before. Uh, maybe Oce Oceanus doesn't necessarily uh, get what Prometheus is saying. Oceanus responds, leave me to be affected by this since it is most advantageous when truly wise to be deemed a fool. Uh, again, you know, uh, it sounds like Sun Tzu, the, the, the Chinese philosopher. Uh, you know, when strong appear weak, when weak appear strong. So he's saying, let's just play dumb, let's just play simple and go talk to Zeus. Uh, and Prometheus acknowledges that he has been referred to as a fool this whole time. Uh, uh, so far, Kratos has called him a fool, and Hephaestus and the chorus have both implied that he's not doing the intelligent thing. So Prometheus realizes how other people see him, how, they, how their theory of mind represents him. And he says, this fault of being truly wise but being deemed a fool, this fault will be seen to be my own. Oceanus says, clearly the manner of your speech orders me back home. So he's not even responding to exactly what Prometheus has said, he's uh, responding to the tone of voice. It sounds uh, to Oceanus as if Prometheus is simply getting tired of talking to him. Prometheus says, so that you won't win enmity for yourself by lamenting for me. In other words, Prometheus is sort of agreeing, yes, I want you to go home instead of going to talk to Zeus on my behalf. Beca it's not because I'm tired of you or annoyed with you, it's because I don't want Zeus to turn on you. You're a little too confident and uh, you think your ability to go reason with Zeus is going to work out and it may actually backfire and hurt you as well. 
Oceanus says, you know, in the eyes of the one who is newly seated on his omnipotent throne, in other words, Zeus, you're, you're afraid of Zeus being angry at me. Prometheus says, beware lest the time come when his art is angered against you. And Oceanus says, your plight, Prometheus, is my instructor. So Oceanus is trying to figure out uh, how Zeus is, is thinking about Prometheus. Uh, maybe this is someone I can reason with, maybe it's not. Uh, but Prometheus, in order to protect Oceanus, has to think about how Zeus sees him, how Zeus will react with uh, rage, with emotion, rather than with reason, if he goes to uh, reason with him. Uh, and he'll react that way against Prometheus, and he'll react that way against Oceanus. And you might add another step here uh, that I don't have in the diagram, which is uh, Prometheus has to think about how Oceanus dis does not understand Zeus. Uh, Oceanus's idea of how Zeus will react is not the way Prometheus thinks uh, Zeus will actually react. So he's got to keep in mind how Zeus will regard Oceanus and how, uh, in, in contrast to that, how Oceanus thinks Zeus will react to Oceanus. And throughout the play, we see Prometheus describing these other characters, sometimes to them directly, uh, sometimes as sort of an argument, uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, in order to protect them or to sympathize with them. Uh, the way he sees Io and understands her suffering, he doesn't just see that this is not something I want to happen to me, but he empathizes, he feels her pain uh, not uh, as, as a warning to him, but as something that is wrong, something that upsets him uh, itself. So her pain hurts him, that's, that's empathy. Uh, he understands, uh, or he tries to figure out what Oceanus understands and what, he, what Oceanus doesn't understand. Um, and he can pretty easily uh, see the error in Hermes and Kratos' thinking, but he also sees how they see him. Uh, he sees why Hephaestus has to do what he has to do because he's afraid to do otherwise. And clearly he spends a lot of time trying to understand Zeus's thinking, representing Zeus's thinking. But notice he also uh, has to sort of have this idea of himself uh, as not Prometheus bound. You know, he's got two different uh, uh, sort of temperaments. He goes back and forth between the character of the Prometheus who is bound, the Prometheus who is defeated, who is being tormented. But he also knows that he is Prometheus the flame bringer. Remember this is the, the title of one of the other uh, plays in this trilogy by Aeschylus. Uh, he, these are not just two different plays, these are two different identities. Uh, and we might go further and say that when he eventually is, is unbound, uh, he's, he's going to be unbound by Heracles, and it's, according to Hesiod, it will be uh, Zeus's will that, uh, that Heracles uh, frees Prometheus. But that's not his only identity. He's not just someone who's, whose fate is up to someone else. He is there by his choice. Uh, he chose to help humanity. He knew he would be punished for it, but he still thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, in spite of, of Zeus's will. So uh, Zeus's power to enforce a particular outcome was not his criteria for deciding what the wise thing to do was, what the right thing to do was. He is breaking free from this moral order that everyone else seems to be pushing him to accept. And so he has to understand their minds, he has to understand how they understand him, but he has to fight their understanding of who he is or who he ought to be or how his mind uh, is working and contrast that with the the person or the, the titan that he wants to be. Uh, he wants to not just be Prometheus bound, not just be the submissive Prometheus that does whatever Zeus wants, but the Prometheus who is the patron of humanity and human civilization, who is willing to sacrifice himself. So he has to keep reminding himself who he is, not this bound titan, but the flame bringer, this, uh, this, this champion who, who has to stand up to, to power, who has to stand up to uh, Zeus's tyranny in order to be that uh, that uh, larger version of Prometheus in order to not be the, the weak bound Prometheus. And so what Aeschylus is doing is very different than what Hesiod is doing as a narrator. Uh, Hesiod just tells us this is the way things are. Aeschylus shows us, well this character thinks it's this way and this character thinks it's this way. Uh, so he's not just telling us the way the world is, he's asking, he's, he's comparing all these different points of view, and he's not even coming in in the end and saying this is the way it is. Now maybe the final uh, play of the, the trilogy, which we don't have, maybe it has something more didactic, more direct. Uh, but what Hesiod is doing is, I'm sorry, what Aeschylus is doing is replacing Hesiod's answers with better questions. 
uh, and what he's doing is something that is going to be what we remember fifth century Athens for, for being. That is the home of philosophy, of, of questioning, of inquiry. And this is really where Hesiod was this sort of, had this sort of authoritarian psychology where he just said, you know, Zeus is the, the creator of the, the order, Zeus knows everything, uh, just obey the, the order as you find it, submit to it, uh, and uh, accept your, your place and accept the place of everyone else and don't try to change it. And Prometheus was bad for trying to upset that order, uh, or at least what he did was foolish or unwise. Uh, in, in contrast to that, uh, Aeschylus doesn't say no what Prometheus did was wise, but he at least gives us Prometheus' point of view in which what Prometheus did was wise. But he contrasts that to these other characters' point of view, which say it wasn't. So by comparing these different types of interpretations, uh, he is acting as a philosopher. He's acting as um, someone who can uh, look at the, the order, the way things are, the way people conventionally think, and question it. And not necessarily jump to a particular conclusion, not just reject the conventional wisdom and adopt the opposite. Uh, so the, the opposite of authoritarianism here is not anti-authoritarianism. Uh, it's easy to be anti-authoritarian when you're not the authority, but then people who start off as anti-authoritarians, typically when they get into a good position, they tend to say, okay, well, let's, let's keep the, the order the way it is now, now that I'm on top. Uh, so it's not necessarily anti-authoritarianism so much as uh, the, the free inquiry of, uh, of philosophy. Uh, you know, now when we tend to use the word philosophy in common use to just mean whatever you happen to think. Like if someone says, well, you know, my philosophy is just do it. Well, that's not a philosophy, that's a cliche. It's a, you know, it's the, the Nike uh, brand logo. Uh, a philosophy is, uh, it literally means the love of wisdom. And it's, it's inquiry. It's not just sort of finding these vague answers that appease our illusion of knowledge. It's defamiliarizing ourselves from the world we think we know and, and saying, well, maybe I don't know it that well. Uh, so the vague schemas and scripts that we never question, that's not philosophy. Philosophy, as the ancient Greeks established it, was critical inquiry, uh, inv investigating all things we think we already know. Uh, it's not a bunch of vague platitudes that you can find in a quote pick meme or something like that. Uh, it involves more questions and answers, but they're better questions. Uh, they're questions that at least help us dispel the illusion of knowledge. Aeschylus was writing his play a generation or so before Socrates, begins his quest to question everything in Athenian culture. But there were still quite a few important Greek philosophers before Socrates uh, who were contemporaries uh, of Aeschylus or came just before Aeschylus. Uh, so Aeschylus, remember, lives between 525 and 456 BCE. Uh, uh, Thales and Anaximander and Pythagoras came a, a generation before him. Uh, Anaximenes and Anaxagoras and Pedocles, Zeno uh, and Heraclitus were all contemporaries. Uh, and Parmenides were all contemporaries of, of Aeschylus. And so these philosophers, while these philosophers were examining the world through dialogue and discussion directly, uh, Aeschylus was doing much the same thing, but he was doing it through this uh, performance, uh, through this, uh, this ritual, this, uh, this, you know, remember that drama uh, evolved from uh, this religious ritual, and now it's become this sort of political uh, thought experiment where people watch these uh, these dynamics uh, play out between these different characters and then talk about it afterwards. So Aeschylus is very much at the heart of the origins of Greek philosophy as we remember it today. So as the opposite of authoritarianism, uh, philosophical inquiry is doesn't simply accept the, the status quo, doesn't simply accept the hierarchy, doesn't accept uh, inequality that is the sort of natural uh, order uh, of things under the, uh, the authoritarian psychology. It's more egalitarian, there's more social mobility. Uh, Socrates uh, started off as a slave uh, and sort of became who he was because people listened to him. You know, he would not have become the, uh, the sort of famous uh, father of philosophy that he did uh, if people weren't, you know, if other intellectual people weren't willing to listen to this low status person. Uh, Authority isn't just dismissed, uh, you know, this is not anti-authoritarian, uh, but authority uh, is said to be derived from the social contract. You know, as members or as citizens of Athens, every, every uh, voting citizen uh, had a sort of responsibility, had a role, had a, a certain importance, and anyone who wanted authority over everyone else had to justify that authority by, uh, by the social contract, by this agreement. And that, uh, 
that archon, that, that ruler, uh, even if there, when, when there was one, uh, was subject to public accountability. Now this wouldn't always be the case in Athens, especially during the, the wartime. It would be this, this up and down. There would be tyrants, uh, and that, that word tyrant uh, in, at this time simply meant a king who was not regulated by a, a constitution, uh, by a certain you know, a sort of formal social contract ahead of time. Uh, and during times of war, you know, essentially they were under a type of martial law, but it was always uh, something that was open to criticism, something that uh, people you know, frequently voiced their, their dissatisfaction with. And uh, so the philosophers were always there. They weren't always in charge, they didn't always get their way. In fact, you know, Socrates gets put to death by the, the, the Council of Athens because he's questioning too much. So you know, there's always going to be that authoritarian backlash, but there were enough of these uh, uh, inquirers, these, these philosophers in Athens at this time, that they were able to um, sort of destabilize that, uh, that social hierarchy. Uh, they were more cosmopolitan. These guys uh, came from all different, uh, different city-states. Uh, some came from you know, islands you know, on the other side of the Mediterranean, as far away as Sicily. Um, they were uh, okay with experimenting, and uh, they were open to new ideas, new explanations of things, whether they were actual direct experiments or just thought experiments, where you say, well, in this situation, would this be okay or would this be okay? Uh, and those sort of thought experiments are, are ideal, the, the, the ideal subjects for uh, playwrights like Aeschylus. Uh, violence wasn't, you know, violence was very much a part, and militarism was very much a part of Athenian society, you know, first during the Persian Wars and then later in the, the wars with Sparta. But it was only considered virtuous when it was uh, uh, preceded by deliberation, and when it was when, when the warriors and the, the the military as a whole showed a certain amount of restraint. And so later during the wars with Sparta, uh, uh, the historian Thucydides will be very critical of you know his own you know city state Athens, uh, but also of the Spartans, and he'll be you know equally praise he'll, he'll praise uh, each of them equally. Uh, so it's not simply you know. Uh, submission to uh, the group. Uh, and then, rather than seeing the golden age as something that happened in the past, they see progress as, as this sort of continuing development, this gradual improvement, and that the, if there is a golden age, it will be uh, ahead of us, but of course it will be so far ahead that we may not get to enjoy it. The best we can do is just make a few improvements at the time. Uh, roles for women may not be great at this point. This is, this is still a very, you know, the, the gender politics are still very uh, structured. But notice that we are not, uh, Aeschylus does not portray women any, anything like what Hesiod does. Uh, Hesiod just sees women as the beautiful evil, uh, these temptresses that pretend to be good but are actually destructive and because they're not hardworking, they just want to uh, be parasites on the, the hardworking men. Um, Clearly, Aeschylus represents in Io deliberately chooses uh, this female character to uh, show the the abuses that uh, she is especially uh, subject to, um, and with the recognition that as long as women are lower in the social hierarchy, they will be uh, more uh, easily victimized. They will be uh, the the tyranny, uh, the sort of trickle down tyranny that that starts at the top. Uh, men will always be able to take out their frustration on someone. Even the uh, a male that is uh, is abused by every other level of society, he can still turn around and uh, abuse his wife. Uh, so women are, are still in a very vulnerable uh, position in this sort of power dynamic, uh, and that will continue uh, throughout the ancient world. But Aeschylus is you know calling attention to that fact. Uh, he's not letting somebody like Hesiod be so dismissive. And the connection of the character of Prometheus with this new emerging. Athenian philosophical culture, with Athens as the sort of uh, meeting place of all of these different uh, philosophers. Uh, this Prometheus's role uh, was commemorated there in Plato's Academy, the the first uh, sort of university uh, where uh, people didn't just study a trade, or you know, uh, there were schools across Mesopotamia and in Egypt where people learned to write. But it's not just about learning some particular uh, skill and copying the, the text that you're handed. Now, uh, Plato's Academy is a, uh, the, the purpose of it is to start asking questions, start investigating, uh, start to try to uh, really begin to ask questions about the world around us rather than just passing on past knowledge. And in that academy, uh, we're, we're told later by uh, Pausanias. Uh, in the academy, there is an altar to Prometheus, and from it, they, uh, the students run to the city carrying burning torches. 
and the contest while running uh, the contest is while running to keep the torch lit and this uh, Carrying the torch will later show up in the, the Olympic Games and is still a part of our tradition today. But that torch is, uh, torch is lit from the, the altar of Prometheus. Uh, so in that academy, they remember Prometheus not just as this sort of trickster figure or this defiant, uh, foolish titan who thought he was gonna get away with, with fooling Zeus. They see Prometheus as this uh, figure who asked questions even when he was under threat, even when uh, the authority figure wanted to suppress that uh, question, wanted to suppress that progress. Uh, he knowingly uh, defied the, the order, defied the authority in order to uh, help uh, humans become the sort of thinking, self-critical, uh, open-minded uh, uh, creatures that, that they would become. And so if we talk about Prometheus today, we still have that cautionary tale that you know where Frankenstein is the modern Prometheus, or you know the Prometheus is, is the ship that goes too far out and, and brings back something dangerous. There's still that that Hesiod sort of uh, warning, uh, but this is also the the icon of, of technology and of learning and of, of question asking that uh, has given us the society that we have today. If you're interested in more uh, resources for uh, Greek mythology in particular, I know a lot of people took this class, you know, some of you told me you took this class specifically because you're interested in, in mythology. Um, I highly recommend, I mean, as always, I recommend primarily going to the primary texts themselves. So in that case, that would be Apollodorus' uh, Bibliotheca or the library. Uh, and there's a, a great edition that combines that with Hyginus' uh, Fabulae. These are both deliberately, the, these are two people who went out and collected stories, collected myths, and, and combined them all uh, into uh, these, these two books. Uh, uh, the Roman uh, writer Ovid does the same thing in The Metamorphosis, and that, by the way, is Io on the front. I'm pretty sure that's Io. Uh, you know, she's, she's got the, the horns uh, that she's been afflicted with. Uh, and also, there's a, there's a great sort of anthology of, of classical myth that has, you know, primary sources. Uh, that's just that's called the anthology of classical myth. Uh, these are better than the sort of you know vague descriptions about well Zeus was the god of thunder and the king of the gods and here are all his characteristics. You know you want to in this as well as any other kind of literature remember it is literature. Find the actual text. Find the uh, who what are the sources uh, for this. Uh, but Prometheus in particular figures into uh, something that is more wide reaching. That is uh, Hans Blumenberg's uh, book Work on Myth. And that is a quite a large uh, book, but uh, Blumenberg sort of applies the character of Prometheus. He traces the the different stories about Prometheus across you know the last you know 2,500 years, and looks at how different societies, uh, different philosophies adapt that character and uh, the the sort of dynamics about a power that that he represents and of of philosophy and of um, uh, human aspiration that he represents in different eras and how different eras. Uh, uh, respond to that. Also, you've got two great resources for free online. One is uh, Theoi text, uh, or the, the Theoi library. Uh, uh, this was a, a resource put together by uh, Aaron Atzma, uh, who's uh, between the Netherlands and, and New Zealand. Uh, this is a, a project that's been put together over the last 17 years, and it's a great resource. It's, it's where I'm, I'm sending you to, to read uh, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, or the, those, those excerpts. Uh, it's relatively readable translations. Uh, and he has a lot of other texts. He has uh, Apollodorus and Hyginus and, and Ovid. Uh, they're, these are older translations. Because they're in the public domain, they're, they're a little bit older, so they, they're a little harder to read. But uh, as far as online free of, uh, freely available resources, that's the easiest place to find them. Uh, the Perseus Project at Tuf Tufts University uh, is a great place to uh, that also has a lot of these texts in collection, and they have uh, uh, direct comparisons where you compare the, the Greek word to the, the English word. And these resources will be helpful uh, going forward as we begin the Iliad and uh, read the Odyssey.